In the summer of 1945, the World War entered its sixth year. The death of Adolf Hitler in April ended the war in Europe. German radio has just announced Hitler is dead. But the pacific war between Allied forces and Japan was already in its fourth year. Afraid that the war might stretch, the Allied forces planned to invade Japan. But the American battle casualties have already been at an all-time monthly high. And since a land invasion might result in more casualties, and in a desperate attempt to stop the war, on August 6, 1945, the US dropped a nuclear bomb named Little Boy on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima. For the first time, the world witnessed the destructive power of nuclear energy. But Japan refused to surrender. Three days later, another bomb, Fat Man, was dropped on Nagasaki. Japan surrendered unconditionally. 6,000 kilometers from the chaos in India, Homi J. Baba, a physicist, was eagerly waiting for the war to end so he can return to Cambridge. In the coming years, he would change his mind and stay back and lay the foundation of the Indian nuclear program, marking the beginning of the Indian nuclear age. This is the story of Homi J. Baba, the father of India's nuclear program. Homi was born into a wealthy Parsi family in Bombay on October 30th, 1909. His father was a well-known lawyer. As a kid, Homi showed signs of being unique. Though he did not show much interest in sports, he would spend most of his time reading and playing with his mechano set, building cars and cranes. At the early age of 15, he passed the senior Cambridge examination. When he turned 18, his parents decided to send him to Cambridge. And, and, and that time, Cambridge was a sort of very happening place in the 1930s. Um, a lot of things about quantum mechanics and the nuclear physics were, were being discovered right in front of his eyes. And, you know, um, and so he could learn, he could assimilate, he could uh, then work with those leaders in that field. That gave him the advantage. From the beginning, his father wanted him to become a mechanical engineer so he could work at Tata Industries. But here at Cambridge, he discovered his passion for physics. He struck a deal with his father that if he did well in the engineering exam, he can later take physics courses. He passed the mechanical tripos in 1930 and later enrolled in PhD program under R.H. Fowler. In the summer of 1939, Homi returned to India for a vacation. He was hoping to return in a couple of months. But in September, Germany invaded Poland, triggering the war in Europe. Homi changed his plan to return, as most of his scientific colleagues joined the war effort and little attention was paid to basic research. He began contacting physicists across the country and received a job offer from C.V. Raman at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Homi joined IISC in 1939. He also received a grant from Tata to set up his cosmic ray research unit at IISC. Even though Homi buried himself in work, he wanted to return to England. But to his surprise, the war restricted finances and it seemed impossible to fund his visit. Homi was disheartened. By 1945, he had been in Bangalore for more than five years, working as a professor at the IISC. During this time, the national movement was gaining force across the country, and it was clear that the British would soon leave India. This is the time when he had a change of heart, and he began wondering how scientific research in independent India could play a role in shaping the country. Yeah, it's, I think slowly it sort of dawned on him that uh... Uh, one thing it was sort of difficult to go back and then also he saw what Raman was doing and uh, I think uh, slowly 
he felt uh, that uh, you know it was possible to do um, things in india because of this four or five years of experience in iisc told him that you know he had many students working on theoretical projects and also he was flying uh, he had uh, done experiments uh, that was being uh, flown on 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 high altitude aircraft um, that it was possible to do this in india also in those days india had some renowned scientists working in labs across the country homi wanted practical application of these research on december 1945 the tata institute of fundamental research was inaugurated in south bombay By 1948, Homi started flying balloons to take experimental instruments to high altitudes. But the rubber balloon could fly only up to 25 kilometers with a payload of 30 kg. In the same year, he came across Skyhawk, a plastic balloon that could fly 27 kilometers in popular mechanics. Thinking that this would help advance the research, he got in touch with an American company, Viking Corporation, to procure plastic balloons. but the us has been using plastic balloons to detect soviet nuclear program and the exports were banned one of his colleague bernard peters suggested that tifr should start making its own balloon in a matter of time tifr developed a plastic balloon that could fly up to 35 km making india the second country after the us to build a high altitude balloon with a heavy payload capacity The fact that India was such a young country and TIFR was hardly a decade old created a stir in the scientific community worldwide. In the next month, India gained independence from the British. Nehru passed legislation drafted by Homi and Dr. Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar in the Constituent Assembly making way for the Atomic Energy Commission. To this date, the Atomic Energy Commission reports directly to the Prime Minister. Homi soon started working on the three-step nuclear program. In 1955, Homi struck a deal with the UK to supply enriched uranium and built India's first nuclear reactor at Trombay. In just over a year, Indian scientists and engineers, working entirely on their own, designed and built Asia's first reactor. I named this swimming pool reactor Apsara. In the early 60s, the tension between India and China was brewing and became more complex with the Chinese nuclear testing in 1964. In a public broadcast through All India Radio, Homi claimed he could deliver a bomb in 18 months from plutonium. On January 24, 1966, Homi was on a plane to Vienna. to attend a meeting of the International Atomic Energy when his Air India flight 101 crashed near Mount Blanc in France to this date the exact cause of the crash is still unknown all 117 on board including the crew died in the crash his death was a loss to india's scientific community and the country as a whole by 1974 8 years after his death India conducted its first nuclear weapon test code named Smiling Buddha at the Pokhran test range. Homi Bhabha's legacy continues to shape India's approach to nuclear technology. Today, India is one of the world's largest nuclear powers and continues to explore new technologies and approaches to using nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. coupled with a doubling of the world's population within the next 100 years which is the least that we can expect this would exhaust the known reserves of fossil fuels in under a century it is in this simple arithmetic no allowance has been made for the fact that the standard of living of the industrially advanced countries is rising and we hope will continue to rise <laughs>